Okay. Thank you everyone for being here. I pledge uh, India Chapter's fourth anniversary as we celebrate the Blockchain Tech Fest 2022. So here is our uh, so Sandeep has about 11 plus years of experience, and he is a blockchain enthusiast and has been working in for the last you know years. And then you know he thrives on design, customer centric solutions uh, with over a decade in consulting. He has also various projects, retraining, ERP implementations to designing cloud-based solutions. So I would like to welcome Sandeep uh, to share his thoughts on, you know, car, you know how you know Green Coin, a blockchain-based tokenization framework, can be leveraged for carbon trading. So welcome, Sandeep. Uh, over to you. Yeah. Thanks, Vikram. Audible. Am I audible? Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah. So today we'll be discussing about Green Point, uh, which is our carbon trading platform, uh, which is our carbon trading platform. Uh, this, this platform is built on blockchain. Uh, this uses a concept of tokenization, which will cover in detail that what exactly which all parts it is going to uh, cater. So there's a lot of buzz in the market about sustainability. Like we need to uh, reduce our carbon emissions. There are uh, Paris Agreement is there, Kyoto Protocol is there, which each nation has to follow. So in order to um, meet those requirements, every nation is like bound and they have to submit their annual reports to United Nations. Okay. Yeah. So before starting, we'll see some of the market trends on carbon emission that what exactly, how is the market update? What all different organizations, industry sectors are doing? So <clears throat> there is a United Nations uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change, which regulates all the carbon management programs running across the world. We have carbon management system, uh, which is being uh, more evaluated by Mondor Intelligence, which is a re uh, research organization. It values the carbon market as 10.93 billion in 2020, and it is projected to be 19.83 billion by 2026, which, uh, which is like a growth of 12.3% during the uh, tenure of 2021 to 2026. There are various market drivers, which is going to help the carbon emission like 75 countries have pledged to achieve net zero carbon emission by 2020. Uh, there is also a global shift towards circular e economy, sustainable mode of production and demands and supply consumption. So we can see there is a lateral shift in um, consumption also. As a consumer, we are trying to use products which are like eco-friendly. So there is a demand and there is a uh, also regulations as per the UN charter. So these, these are the industry drivers, which is like focusing our, uh, changing our focus towards uh, carbon emission reduction. Companies have uh, also focusing on purchasing goods, energy consumed during the production of these goods, direct emissions, and uh, also the logistic part will also come into picture. There are potential renewable energy sources which are being utilized like solar energy or other, uh, other uh, sources which are being uh, promoted by the government. So uh, I we would like to see some key industry initiatives. Uh, some of the key industry initiatives in different, in, uh, like in manufacturing, we have uh, Siemens, which has targeted to be carbon neutral by 2020. Uh, in IT industry, Facebook targets to reduce its carbon emission by 75%. Uh, from the government point of view, Copenhagen uh, aims to be the world's first carbon neutral city in the world by 2025. Um, in the retail sector, uh, IKEA is also trying to become energy uh, neutral and be an energy uh, provider. So uh, these are some of the initiatives which we have seen. There are many more initiatives which are uh, taken by various organizations because this is ultimately going to help us achieve our sustainable goals. Now, <clears throat> we have seen a lot of uh, talk about carbon reduction. Now, how we are going to achieve 
if somebody is a car, uh, some organization is carbon surplus uh, they can promote or help other organizations who are carbon deficit so they can trade with the carbon and they can help and promote the projects which are like green initiative projects or some kind of solar projects or various other uh, projects some of the important projects which in india which are going on um, i could list is uh, general vijayanagar city they have saved around 225 million dollars <clears throat> in 5 years power power good in um, andhra pradesh is currently selling around 147 tons of carbon credits which they have on through their business activity um handia forest and mp they earn annually they earn around 3 lakh dollars from carbon payments by restoring forest so they are doing uh, great work from the this is from the government point of view torrent park torrent park is a park is earning around 200 crores from the energy efficient projects which they are into uh, there is also grassim industry which has earned around 5 crores in energy projects so these are some of the initiative which we can see in our indian um, context there are also other global initiatives which are going on now in order to understand how uh, carbon trading uh, takes place there there can be we, we have taken a scenario where there is a like regulatory body uh, there there are two manufacturing units one is a low pollution plant another is a high pollution plant definitely the high pollution plant will uh, use the carbon credits which is allocated to them uh, beyond the limit and low pollution plant can be energy surplus so they can mutually transfer their uh, carbon credits but in order to transfer their credits mechanism like no <coughs> they have to go through a regulatory body there is no uh, clear uh, mechanism which can a uh, transparent mechanism and an immutable mechanism which can help trace the carbon emissions and also other uh, trading between the carbon emission so uh, we we saw that there are few key drivers in the market which helps in uh, carbon market like uh, new developments enhancing the carbon market accessibility and liquidity there is a nationally determined contribution under the paris agreement in which each nation has to submit their annual report that how much carbon deficit they have been and what all measures they are taking in order to be a uh, carbon neutral or achieving net zero emissions there are corporates which are uh, having initiatives through csr activities to be carbon neutral and achieve net zero targets like scl itself is doing some good work sponsoring some ngos to uh, uh, initiate uh, reduce the carbon emissions and also within uh, their premises they are also taking initiatives to reduce their carbon emission so <clears throat> also there is um, after the kyoto protocol which was signed in 2005 uh, again the paris agreement was there which brings in article 6 to like redefine the carbon offset markets so while redefining the carbon offset markets there have been three initiatives which have come into existence like Euro european union has come up with their uh, emission trading system similarly california also have their uh, cap and trade program uh, korea emission trading system china national eps so these are the key initiative trading platforms indian government also have uh, one uh, exchange which is national commodity and derivative exchange Uh, which deals in uh, carbon trading but all these platforms are like centralized platform but there is always a need for a decentralized platform which because the centralized platforms have some problems which we'll be discussing now uh, there is always a difficulty found in mobilizing the potential supply uh, there are carbon certificates issued but uh, while doing the carbon reduction some carbon uh, certificates are issued issued but there is always a danger of uh, like double spending those carbon certificates uh, there whatever uh, implementations are there they are fragmented there is unclear life cycle of issued carbon credits there can be a one major issue of over crediting and um, also there is a lack of cross market exchange value like uh, a unified value 
of the carbon credits is uh, not generalized. So there is no standardization available right now. So these are the challenges which we can overcome through uh, implementation of uh, blockchain. So <clears throat> if, if we have, the blockchain may provide a solution which can help the carbon trading um, bringing all the stakeholders on a particular network and it can help in uh, creating the tokens like all the carbon credits will be issued in form of tokens and they can be easily available for trading on the platform so it, it will be a kind of a digital marketplace where consumers can buy and sell uh, carbon credits on the net platform uh, this platform also provides kind of automation where smart contract is responsible for minting burning and distribution of carbon tokens so <clears throat> Um, as you can see over there that we have investors, green projects and purchasers. So purchasers are uh, generally those organizations which, um, which are carbon deficit. Now also with carbon trading, we are enabling a new asset class to be defined, which is the carbon asset class. So people who want to invest, they can also buy and trade on carbon tokens. So right now we generally go in the marketplace or any exchange to buy some shares. But right now we can also trade with, for a good cause for a green initiative. So investors can come over there and provide do uh, carbon trading. Now with the blockchain, it helps to record the transactions. It provides a better governance. It also helps in better uh, trading. There can be multiple stakeholders in the network like regulator, energy industry, uh, project verifiers, liquidity providers, or NGOs who are promoting green projects. Now, <clears throat> we have uh, developed a framework called Greenpoint Framework. Uh, this framework is a carbon trading platform which helps to trade uh, multiple carbon credit tokens. It has multiple features like uh, fungible tokens. It provides to trade on fungible tokens. So each carbon credit is uh, represented as a token and that can be easily tradable on the network. Uh, this solution is a no code solution where we can define our own rules and easily customizable. Um, it also provides a smart contract handling. It can be easily integrated with other networks as well. So these are the important features of our framework. Now coming to the architecture point of view, this framework is built upon hyperledger fabric where we have um, different channels, orders, peers, certificate authorities, certificate authorities, and <coughs> So we, uh, in our implementation, we uh, devise two channels, basically an ESG channel and carbon market channel. Now ESG is um, uh, a score which is being provided to each entity, um, which helps us to identify whether they are a good uh, promoter of carbon emissions or not. So there are various uh, parameters which will define in the ESG channel and based on that, uh, your credit score will be calculated and then accordingly you will be eligible for a uh, quota of uh, those uh, tokens which can be traded. Then we have the carbon market channel in which uh, we can trade uh, among the tokens. So as an interface, you will have the functionality for defining the token. Once you have defined the token, you can uh, define the contract as well where you define the rules and then once uh, the rules have been finalized, you can um, publish the rules, define it, uh, and then issue the tokens. And these issue tokens can be traded in the network. Once the trade has been complete, let's say somebody wants to redeem this token, they can also redeem it. Uh, user management is also a part of this uh, solution. We have, uh, we have connected the green key in Austin DB also. So some of the data is uh, stored in Austin DB. 
and all of this then it can be integrated with any of the database like Azure, SQL, Oracle, or you know, any database. Now, what are the benefits of trading using blockchain? Earlier we discussed about the solution. Uh, it provides us a standardization. Uh, the, some of the basic problems in the existing system was a standardization. So it brings standardization. The centralized control is now decentralized as we move over to blockchain. It increases the liquidity because we are using more uh, investors as carbon has been a new asset class which has been defined. Uh, it also increases the accessibility. Also, by using the blockchain, we increase the security, we minimize the investment threshold. Blockchain also brings the transparency among the stakeholders, so all the participants in the network get more transparency about the data. They, it brings better compliance, it helps in rights management. So these are the, some of the benefits which we have observed in uh, using blockchain in carbon trading. Also, uh, prior to carbon trading, we also need to track carbon emissions. So, <clears throat> just to touch base on how uh, blockchain can be helpful for carbon emissions tracking also. So, there is there are industry needs like uh, the uh, current process for carbon emissions tracking is less reliable. Uh, and the process to calculate the carbon emission is complex, inaccurate. Uh, like for carbon emissions tracking, there are scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. Scope one emission lies within the pursuit of what business activity we are doing. So, the direct uh, direct emissions are under scope one. Uh, scope two is in the indirect emissions like the services which we are availing. Let's say the energy services which we are availing. Availing uh, it can be electricity services or any process fuel which we are using. Scope 3 lies in the pursuit of, let's say, uh, the indirect activities through our employees, let's say, some uh, business travel is there or some goods are purchased. So, all those lies in scope 3. So, uh, one more challenge comes into picture is that there is no standardized approach for measurement and analysis of green greenhouse gas emission. Again, uh, double spending of carbon credit certificate is also a challenge. Uh, there is a, definitely a need of immutable near real time dissemination of greenhouse gas information for all the stakeholders so that they can take the corrective measures to reduce their carbon emissions. So, if we implement a blockchain on uh, the network, we need to bring all the participants on, on a particular blockchain network. So, you can see the representation over here where the, we have uh, taken uh, different examples like manufacturing, production plant, uh, distribution, or mining, uh, regulatory body, or a uh, logistic provider. So, they all need to follow the same regulatory compliances, and all the data is near real time shared with everyone with less amount of data leakage. Now we have a detailed view of uh, greenhouse emission tracking on blockchain as we discussed just now that <clears throat> emissions can be tracked as a scope 1, scope 2 and scope 3 where scope 1 comes from the direct business activity. So these emissions need to be tracked again the scope 2 where they mentioned electricity, fuel, gas or any fossil fuel emissions which are like indirect emissions. Then for the scope 3 emissions, good transportation, waste generation and capital growth. So these, these emissions need to be tracked in a blockchain so that the result level becomes immutable. Similarly, they can be vendor partners with whom we are doing a subcontracting. So they will also have their scope one, scope two, scope three emission. And also the regulatory body will ensure that all the regulatory compliances are being followed up. So this was all from our side. Uh, any questions, anyone?
Yes, so definitely we need a permission kind of network because all the regulatory compliances have to be followed and uh, we cannot go ahead with a public network because there has to be some regulation which is uh, followed. So it, we need a semi decentralized or permission kind of network uh, in order to manage the platform properly. And again, it is, you know, uh, permission, yes, but uh, permission doesn't say that, you know, we can't open it up, right? It can be permission, but, you know, uh, just for adding nodes, right, uh, it is still permission. But otherwise, for participating, you can always, you know, make it open to people, right? So, uh, you know, so we are looking at it from a different view. Yes, it is permission. Yes, you, you know, choose who participates in it. Yes, you know, uh, to provide that level of immutability, right? But otherwise, when it comes to the participation in that, you don't necessarily have to be closed. You can be open for participation, but close for you know who can act no, or who can participate in a consensus, right? So that that is the reason, I suppose. Okay. Yes. yes. Yeah, 
ऑलरेडी जो बीच है तो आई एम सम ठीक है एजेंट का तो मोर करते हैं कि वो ये सिस्टम को कोर पे सेंटर पर जाए नो इट विल नॉट बी अ सेंट्रलाइज्ड सिस्टम बिकॉज़ ऑल द नोड्स विल बी हैंडेड एज अ पार्टिसिपेंट ओनली सो वी More more yeah, see, that is why it is it is in a permission network format because the regulatory bodies are the governing bodies who will decide the rules and regulations, and rest all nodes are something like that. They have a specific role. Okay. Yeah. So, so that so that that can be managed like we have in the architectural diagram we showed the user management. Right. So through user user management, we can assign different roles, and that can be managed from there. Yeah. You can ask me if you still have doubts. So there can be, you know, for every node, you know, they can have their own users, right? Who subscribe to their node to, you know, get those services. So they can even use the authorization server before their node. to you know allow them so maybe there is something like it would be allowed them to some in security mode inside yes and if the security would be all okay and all those are the things that are there so they are the they can all have power right they can share power so power so the power is only with the consent right there is no separate power when it comes to you know especially like the database you can participate in consent you can say yes or no yeah i agree or i do not agree And even do not agree is not really an option. The consensus is only to the part where you know do we all agree that this was the last state and this is the new state when you know this data comes up, right? So essentially, if you have written a smart contract in a way where you say this particular node is allowed to you know provide this kind of a you know input and they are allowed to add this entry, regulator is just a watchdog over there and saying, okay, is it happening right? Is something going wrong? So that is their main role. Their role is not to say what to add to the network, but whatever has been added. is it wrong wrong in the sense should it not have been added right maybe someone you know says okay you know i have this farm and you know i you know i've been investing into it and it should be calculated towards my esg score now he was just doing farming he was not really planting a forest right he was a farmer in doing a farming so that doesn't necessarily contribute to the esg factor right so that is where you know regulated to say hey why did you you know allocate some tokens to that guy right Or what kind of, or maybe you know, they submitted a report saying you know, okay, this is a certificate, and then that certificate doesn't seem valid to them. So those kind of things they can say, hey, I found this issue, and then that can be corrected. It's not like you know, it is written on blockchain, you can't correct it. You can just that you can't delete what has happened. You can just do corrective actions, right? So you can still do the, all that. So that is why you know, uh, this makes sense. You know, a private or a hybrid kind of a model for you know, this kind of a point makes sense. of course you know it's not really that this is the only solution right so everyone you know the way that i have been looking at you know how customers are implementing everyone has their own perspective and just because their that particular use case had you know one or two differences in how they were going to implement it's made a hell lot of a difference on which blockchain platform to pick very big difference you know some of the customers that have come to me they say hey i have about what Hundred thousand or maybe you know five hundred thousand customers of mine. Now in that case, you know they have already used permission blockchain. Now they say no, I want to move away from permission. So they are such customers, and then there are customers who say, hey, I was planning to do it on this, but you know I see it's slow, and you know I need too much data to be put in. And how do I manage you know things that who comes into the network? Otherwise, in public, everyone has a you know voice, right? So sometimes so that also becomes a pain for you. So it it is you know on the both sides. It's just because what perspective you bring into that solution, and even with the same solution, minor tweaking can you know can be a major difference when it comes to blockchain. So that is why it is also important that you know when you choose which platform to use, it has to be the right platform. You have to invest into it to understand that you are investing into the right platform rather than just investing into it or maybe choosing the okay this. You know, blockchain platform X, Y, and they have done it. They are successful. Let me use this one. So that's not really a yardstick that they should use. So that's you know my take on that. Thanks, thanks everyone for being a wonderful audience. Yes, sir. <laughs> So 
So interoperability, you know, everyone wants it. It's a utopia of blockchain at, at this point. And uh, there are so many interoperable solutions, but what I have found is that if you have to be interoperable, you have to plan before you, you know, uh, get into a blockchain. If you get into a blockchain, get into a solution, you go live, then, you know, there are, you know, too many complexities involved if you want to go interoperable. Yes, you can still go about it. And then, you know, of course, you know, you generally many a times, you know, it, it is a custom solution that is preferred for interoperability. Right, because you know you may have chosen one blockchain, and then you know the interoperable platforms may not be supporting it. So that is one of the other reasons why there are so many challenges. But I think you know we are moving in the right direction when it comes to interoperability. Hyperledger, you know, we saw that Hyperledger cacti, right? So that is you know exactly the right direction. Uh, one of the right directions that you know we are moving into. So that is what I love about Hyperledger cacti. And they had two such solutions, right? And now they are merging into one. So that is where there are so many improvements happening. Because, you know, we are learning from mistakes, we are learning from things. We are still young, right? Uh, so blockchain is still young, not just me, right? Yeah. So that is where we are at. Any questions from the room or from the panel? Yes. Sorry? Onboarding of whom? Onboarding of people. Yes. So you're saying that there are so many different type of participants and how do they start or become part of something or initiate? I would say that, you know, the answer to that would be that there has to be a platform. Right. Someone has to invest into that platform. It could be government bodies, you know, investing into platform or otherwise what I've seen is influential players, maybe, you know, who have, you know, uh, maybe who are too big. It is always someone who is too big and, you know, can influence others to join it. That is the only way to start. I don't think, you know, factories themselves, you know, uh, can, you know, start their own, you know, uh, carbon trading or ESG platforms and you know expect others to start it has to be someone influential yes you know they can not saying uh, not entirely no but yes it has to be someone influential so that they can bring other participants and when we say participants there are various different types of participants not just one so there are participants yes factories industries but then there would be you know bigger players as well right industry you know uh, big industrial uh, companies right so they'll have to you know probably make way make room for others to join that network or because you know I, if i expect everyone to host a node one that's not you know economically feasible right it's not budgetarily feasible for you know everyone to host on their own node and again blockchain platforms if they become this big they you know the management overhead and the network requirement itself increases that is where I said that, you know, you go with permission blockchain, you, you know, few of the players come together, few of the, you know, reliable ones come together, you know, government has won. And then, you know, maybe, you know, some banks or something like that, some, you know, bodies can come together and then they can create their, you know, their nodes and their platform. And then they can offer that platform as a service to others so that they don't really have to invest into, you know, their own node. They can just be a user of, of that particular service, right? But it has to be transparent. Transparency is must. That's why, you know, again, you know, coming back to fabric, because transparency is must. While, you know, you do a closed for who creates those nodes, but the data, that has to be transparent, what is happening, who is doing what, that has to be transparent. We should know. Anyhow, you know, you have, we have seen so many places that there are, you know, uh, meters put up, okay, how much, how bad is the pollution, right? We are, we are living in Delhi, so we know uh, it the best. So that's why I'm saying, uh, so it has to be completely transparent. We have to be transparent about the ESG. Maybe, you know, some data is not favorable, not suitable, but still it has to be transparent so that people, you know, maybe point fingers or something like that so that, you know, we improve. The end goal is improvement. Okay, thank you, Sandeep. Thanks for your time and, you know, uh, for giving, sharing this, you know, presentation with us. Uh, do we have any question from... Uh, uh, from the virtual audience. <clears throat> Arun, any questions? I see uh, you are the one, you know, joining us virtually.
Okay. Uh, with that, I suppose uh, uh, I'll give you a thanks. And then next, uh, we have Pratyush with us. Pratyush. So Pratyush is, uh, Pratyush is currently a student and a blockchain enthusiast. And uh, he is, you know, uh, doing E, E, and E, right? Yeah, electrical. Yeah, electrical and engineering. Sorry, I'm not that good at it. So electrical and engineering from Manipal University, right? Uh, Institute. Technology. Yes. So I'll hand it over the stage to you so that uh, uh, you can. No, I don't suppose it's arrived. Good afternoon, everyone. So hereby, I would like to mention a very uh, prominent problem that exists with uh, almost a vast amount of population out there. That is about recording our medical history out there. So how many of us can we keep track of our medical history from our birth to as we grow older and older? Like uh, keeping all those prescriptions together, all those reports, x-ray reports, your blood regulation reports and all, and getting a meaning out of that. So that's actually a huge task and currently there's no protocol that actually, that actually is taking care of that. And to solve that problem, we come across with this concept, VSCA. VSCA stands for Verifiable Interoperable Secure Care Architecture Protocol. VSCA brings in uh, the power of uh, healthcare uh, amalgamation with blockchain where the interoperability meets the security part with the composable healthcare. Building a decentralized healthcare app is a complex process. What all problems that comes into place are as the technical complexity with the problem, like maintaining the decentralized infrastructure that exists out there, the data privacy and the security, data interoperability, user experience, compliances, network effects, like uh, getting the new user onboarding onto our systems, integrations, and a huge problem about when the vendor lock-in. To solve all these problems out there, Visca is here. Visca brings in the interoperability by means of a health job as a state solution. Visca protocol is a comp composable and decentralized health job ready for developers to build on so they can focus on creating a great experience and not scaling their users. Then, uh, Visca enables cross chain uh, contracts by means of inter blockchain communication, that is IBC. IBC enables the, enables the creation and execution of the cross-chain contracts allowing for seamless communication and interoperability between different blockchain networks. For the dev simplification, we are employing the power of the Hyperledger Firefly, which simplifies development by providing a user-friendly interface and comprehensive tools for building decentralized applications on the top of secure and scalable blockchain platforms. And finally, for data privacy, which is aided by FHE and zero-knowledge protocols. Users 
take control of their health information. They own their medical records. They decide who has access to their medical data. <clears throat> now let's have a glance what the health graph actually means about. A health graph is a representation of individuals health data and related information in a structured format that can be easily shared and analyzed. It is composed of data from a variety of resources like the electronic health records, personal health devices like your Fitbit or the mobile, health, mobile devices and other resources and it is designed to enable interoperability between those different systems. This process improves the medical record management and respects patient privacy, facilitates research, disease prediction, automates hospital administration, reduces unnecessary doctor visits, accurately calculates the health insurance rates, enhances data sharing and personalizes patient care, which is our utmost importance. Now, moving on to what VISTA actually is. So, as I mentioned, already mentioned, VISTA stands for Verifiable Interoperable Security Architecture, which brings in an ever revolutionary approach to managing medical data that empowers individuals who can take control of their health information into their own hands and share it securely with trusted parties. Using the cutting edge blockchain technology with FHE and zero knowledge proofs, the protocol enables the creation of decentralized health graph that can be accessed and updated by the patients, healthcare providers, and researchers based upon their authorization needs. The composable nature of health graph allows for the easy integration with other systems and applications, fostering a seamless and interoperable ecosystem for health data. This leads to improved collaboration and coordination among different stakeholders, ultimately resulting in better healthcare services and outcomes. Vista's initial protocol was developed and inspired by the Lens protocol and Uh, during the ETH India 2020, 2022. Wait, now what Starlight is and what's it connected to Visca? So Visca has been using the, the prototyping power of the Starlight to execute the ZK knowledge proofs out there. Uh, now moving on to what Starlight is. So Starlight is a prototype a compiler uh, that is contributed by the EY teams and is designed to support the need of the complex business agreement where business logics needs to be shared between parties at network level, but the privacy from the competitor is also critical. For more details on uh, Starlight, you can go on to the GitHub repository that is our uh, link below. Now moving on to the compiler architecture. So basically there's something we call Zapify that is about compiling the Solidity code as a means uh, into the uh, in coordination with your ZK proofs to create a ZOL file. The compiler must take the Zolidity file, that is a .zol file, and complete the following simplified steps. First of all, it passes, takes the ZOL code, analyzes it, and creates an abstract syntax tree, or AST, and representation of that code. Then it transforms changes that AST into a circuit AST, a smart contract AST, and an orchestration AST, which are required for the deployment of the ZK proofs. Then it generates the codes for the output ZApp circuit, that is, the uh, the basic three requirements include the circuit part, the contract part, and the orchestration code. Uh, here's an extended version of how the parsing and the transfers of uh, the Zolidity code actually works with the help of the Starlight compiler. Uh, this is um, being attached as a reference. The, uh, ex the detailed expression regarding this is actually out of the scope of this presentation. So uh, for reference, if you need more information, you can move on to the repository. This is attached there as well. Now moving on to the architecture for the Vista 2.0. So uh, after the hackathon, we have iterated upon how we can actually extend this idea to bring it to further more composable and uh, more extended version of that. So for that, we design an architecture and we have brings in you the Vista 2.0. So Vista 2.0 comprises of different uh, components are listed out there, that is, like the tenacity network. So it is the native chain for the Visca, which is based out of Cosmos SDK and runs the Cosmos and contracts out there. Then there's something called edge grid. Edge grid is a multi-predatory matrix, which uh, executes the data for the mixed net uh, uh, as we are uh, 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 dealing with a lot of private information that exists in the medical records. So for that, a mixed net concept is used by the, that is being derived from the NIM blockchain and the edge grid actually takes care of that component. 
then H, H mesh is about the interlinking of those uh, <coughs> ZK protocols with the unique identities that exist out there and the authorization part. H bridge is about bringing the interoperability different the multi-chain ecosystem. That's when Vista goes on there. Then H vault is about storing your credentials. That is the decentralized credentials out there. For that, we are using a coconut credential scheme that uh, the NIM uh, blockchain has been working upon. The NIM team has been working upon. And for that, uh, we are using the NIX blockchain ecosystem. Then at the center, it acts the Vista uh, multi-chain contracts which interfere with each other by means of an IBC and also uh, one of the protocol that we are currently working upon. Then uh, below that layer is about the Hyperledger Firefly, which actually takes care of all the deployment uh, and deployments needs so that the developers who are building upon our layer of Vista 2.0, they won't have to worry about the node calibration or setting up of the complex network out there. And they can just more focus upon developing the logic for their D apps. And then below is about the decentralized storage part, wherein there's a shared storage for the public data or the metadata that can be out there. Then the private database that is about the uh, critical information that exists in the medical records, and then the blockchain part. Now moving on to the Athena. So Athena is an FHE engine, which is currently in development. Athena is a full FHE, which stands for fully homomorphic encryption, is a technique wherein uh, in uh, the analytics or different logics can be run over the data without actually decrypting it. And Athena is designed for a decentralized medical record keeping where it allows for the secure storage and processing of sensitive medical data without the need to decrypt the information. This ensures privacy and confidentiality of the patient's personal and medical information. It utilizes the concept of dynamic NFTs to provide a unique digital identity for each medical health record. Like each health record is in the form of a dynamic NFT so that whenever a report changes or parameters changes, they are automatically get updated by means of a decentralized oracle or that NFT record. And then the soul bound tokens, which actually bound to your particular wallet or identity of the user and takes care uh, to grant access to the encrypted medical records recording on the NFTs. This combination of the technologies overall allows for the decentralized storage and processing of medical records, improving the efficiency and effectiveness of the healthcare industry. Now there are different use cases for which Visca can be deployed upon, like teleconsultation. The uh, the apps the, or the developers who are interested in, in building the teleconsultation apps, they can utilize the Visca layer to uh, uh, share the private data remotely or uh, with the doctor out there without concerning about the data privacy or the security needs. A prescription, which can be something uh, which maybe we will be seeing in the future, wherein all the uh, health records can be just uh, in the form of all, all your prescriptions can be in form of just uh, electronic mode like the EMR extension version. And uh, all this can be in form of dynamic NFTs, which keeps on iterating themselves as soon as you, the latest medical data is available out there. Then the healthcare logistics part, which also gets improved uh, by means of our protocol. Then UHI management. So recently, uh, Government of India has been working upon United Healthcare Interface, which is something similar to the UPI. So we are also uh, working upon to match the protocol to be suitable to the uh, uh, to be suitable to um, you, you know like combine with the and also like being interoperable with the UHI management thing because that's something we see like will be the future of healthcare in India will look like. Then the visualization part so it's uh, like it can be something that we might all relate like all those blood reports they have a lot of scientific stuff out there which is not uh, very used to for the daily user out there. So for getting insights out of their data uh, and the Visca uh, analytic layer can be analyzed, which basically uh, interprets those scientific records and uh, gives you a better visualization. Now, how, here's about how Visca actually started. So the idea of Visca was born out of the recognition that current healthcare system often struggle with data silos and interoperability issues. Me and one of my friends applied for the ETH India Hackathon in the November 2022. Then in the same month, we got accepted for the ETH India Hackathon presence out there. Then in the, in the first week of December, we built uh, in the ETH India in the, in the Bangalore uh, this year itself. And uh, we were also announced that the EY Starlight winner out there. 
Then after the hackathon, we traded and we uh, worked upon like, okay, this was a small project that we built, how we can actually extend this technology, how we can build upon this layer to bring in the health, to, suit, to bring in the solution for the uh, healthcare need. So then we started iterating for the Vista 2.0. Also, we recently onboarded our first set of developers uh, who are interested on building upon our layer and are closely working with us. Then Vista 2.0 is announced and uh, it is currently in development with all the Athena and the FHE engine in place. For the March 23, we are taking a target where the Vista uh, chain will be available in beta for the uh, uh, end users to try out or the developers to build upon and uh, will be going multi-chain. Now here's our action plan. Like we have divided our uh, whole action into like a uh, whole plan into the three phases, wherein the first one is about the research, wherein we'll research and evaluate different technologies that can be utilized to achieve the desired goals of the second iteration of the protocol that is Vista 2.0. Then the second comes mm -hmm. about the prototyping stage, that is developing a prototype for the Vista platform using the technologies that we identified in the phase one. Then finally the testing, wherein we will conduct extensive product testing to ensure its functionality. And also it will also involve like auditing of the smart contracts. Now, here's a developer portfolio where, as I already mentioned, some of the teams are interested to build upon our own layer. So here's a demo where uh, like a startup team who has been working upon developing of the uh, medicine by means of drone. They are interested to build upon the Vista layer. So we are closely working upon them, how to match upon their needs. And this is a snapshot of their uh, trying out. So yeah, thank you so much for taking time to hear me out uh, regarding the, our vision. It, it, it is really a pleasure to sharing it with you. And we hope this marks the beginning of a productive collaboration that will revolutionize the healthcare. If you have any observation or feedback on our ideas, we would love to be grateful for the opportunity to learn from your experience and thought. I'm open for any Q&A. Also, this QR code is available on which uh, anytime in future or uh, now itself, if you want to go and move, have the view of the documentation on any of the resources regarding this protocol, it will be uh, available out here. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot for your time. Any questions, anyone? I have had a you know, lovely presentations today. So any questions? Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, like uh, today also I haven't slept. Like I've been uh, working last night on the presentation itself, and like this morning, six thirty, I actually left my home to attend the presentation out here. <laughs> wow! And being a student, you know, you are, I think you know you, you have explained that to you know people who have been practicing, and you know, no one has any questions, so you can you know yeah, think of that. That's, so that's a great applause in itself, I suppose. Thank you so much. That's actually what Hyperledger actually motivates me. Like my journey was actually started with Hyperledger Fabric itself, like with the blockchain. Like I was trading upon an IoT project and there I felt a need where I need to record all that data in a, and share it on a to the mass public. And then where I came across the Hyperledger Fabric concept. So that's like the part and that's like I, I can closely connect with the Hyperledger family out there. So that was the kind of motivation that just motivated me. To no, be no, great to have you with us. Great to have you with us. Yeah. Okay. And also, like, I would like to give a huge thanks to Sir. Like, uh, he uh, basically come, like, uh, uh, accepted my presentation at the very last. Uh, like, uh, I was not able to, you know, submit it. So to you know, to be, you know, say no to. So <laughs> I would simply put it this way. Yes. Thank you, sir. Yes. So we are glad to have, have hosted you. So uh, with that, you know, we'll break for lunch. So lunch is also organized upstairs and then, you know, we'll be back, I suppose, in uh, the time is two, you know, when we are supposed to start, but I think, you know, there will be, you know, some delay. So I'll communicate to you as we, you know, we go. If you can all please, you know, head upstairs. <clears throat>